Welcome to the Take the North podcast. I'm David Hoff from the Mullen Haw Show on 670 The Score. Dan Readers from the Chicago Tribune spent all weekend, boy, busy as ever. Dan, uh, the Bears had one of the most eventful weeks in one of the most impactful months uh, in recent memory in terms of the offseason. The big news, of course, Justin Fields traded on Saturday night to the Pittsburgh Steelers for a conditional Sixth round draft pick in 2025. We are reacting after the fact. We have a little bit more information, a little better perspective, and certainly, certainly tons of reaction throughout Chicago and throughout Bears fandom. I and I, sorry, just filling out my NCAA tournament. Oh, okay. oh yeah, there yeah. was, there, there was, uh, oh, yeah, there was Bears news this weekend, wasn't there? Yes, there was. Uh, yes, there you was. make a great point. I mean, Saturday evening was the moment that. So many people were anticipating for a long time where it finally happened that the Justin Fields era came to an end in Chicago. Ryan Poles made a deal with the Pittsburgh Steelers for a future sixth round pick that becomes a future four if Justin Fields is able to be on the field for 51% of the, the snaps in Pittsburgh next season. I was on the radio on Sunday afternoon as you were as well with Mark Grody, and I've had so many thoughts and so many different angles to this entire Justin Fields trade and what's happened here in the last 24 hours, David, that I can't even keep all my notes straight because there's so many different subplots to all of it. Right. Right. And maybe, maybe we start first with, with the trade compensation. Right. And and yeah, I think because you, you look at the deal and you evaluate the deal and then you look at the football repercussions and then you start to look a little bit, zoom out a little bit more and you look at all the things that have swirled and what this represents in terms of the, the end of that conversation and all the yelling. But let's start with the compensation. Sixth round draft pick, conditional, uh, if he plays 51% of the snaps, becomes a fourth in 2025. Right. There's also a report after the fact from, from me in a report, which I have, I'm skeptical about. Yes. I'll just be honest please, about it. Please, I'm skeptical, skeptical about the veracity of it and, and how accurate it might be because it suggests that the Bears had other options and other chances to trade for a higher return um same reporter had the bears not necessarily shopping justin Fields, so i'm a little confused uh as far as what to believe in this transactional nature of this reporting so i'm gonna just stick with what we know the bears are getting a sixth rounder back for justin fields to me dan that says that the league rejected justin fields as a starting quarterback the bears may have gone into it asking for too much and maybe showing their hand and revealing too much by saying they wanted to do right by Justin. Everything combined to give the Bears a smaller market than they expected. But in the end, I think Ryan Poles recognized that getting something is better than getting nothing, and they had to move on from the Justin Fields era. One of the angles you mentioned there is the information pipeline and the way some of this stuff swirls around in ways that makes it very hard for even us who are are in the business to – present information, much less the people that are just trying to, to follow it from afar as fans or, or an audience, it's hard to keep track of. When, as you mentioned, NF, NFL Network's Ian Rappaport reports earlier in the week that Justin Fields wasn't even being considered for a trade by the Chicago Bears, and then reports several days later that they had so many inquiries coming into the building that they had to make the one that fit Justin right. You're just Your head is spinning off, off its axis. As you said, let's just stick to what we know here. Um, I never expected them to get a great return on the trade for Justin Fields. I expected them to get a lot more than they did. I was not only jarred by the fact that it was a sixth round pick that they settled for in the end, but that it was a future six. We're talking about 2025. You you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers don't even have to put that payment in the mail until next February, (laughs) you know? And so you're in a situation here where, where this trade does not help the 2024 Chicago bears in any other way than clearing the deck for the next quarterback. It also took me aback when you look at all the movement around the league on the backup quarterback market. We talked for a week plus about, about the starting quarterbacks that changed homes, you know, Baker Mayfield, Stan put Kirk cousins to Atlanta, Russell Wilson to Pittsburgh, all the things that Gardner Minshew to, to the Raiders. You look at Mac Jones to Jacksonville. You look at Kenny Pickett, the most recent one before the Justin Fields trade to Philadelphia. You look at Mariota to Washington, Sam Darnold placeholder in Minnesota until they move up and draft a guy here in a month. You know, Mitch Trubisky re-signing in Buffalo, Desmond Ritter to Arizona. The things that those teams paid to get those players was significantly more than this 
pick it up at the curb and leave whatever you feel we should have in our mailbox deal that the Pittsburgh Steelers just took from the Chicago Bears. I mean, it, it, it's stunning to realize that a player drafted 11th overall in 2021. The Bears traded up and gave away a bunch of draft capital, leaves your building for a future six. I, I, I still can't get my brain around it. But as I tweeted on Sunday, David, along with that, Ryan Poles' job is to see this through a bigger picture lens. And if the bigger picture lens tells you, okay, we're going to settle for something mm-hmm. less than we expected, at the very least, this, this move is going to be defined by how Justin Fields' replacement, which we presume at this point is Caleb Williams but may not be, uh, fares over the next five years. And so I, I think in five years from now, we're not going to be looking back on uh, capital of this trade <laughs> no, no, took, took a, a low risk investment that I probably would have done if I were them. There's no doubt about it. I mean, there's so much noise. There's so much noise uh, surrounding the Justin Fields era and certainly the final days of it. And there's so much attention and I get it. This is the way we're conditioned to look at everything in the NFL, the draft, the draft matters and draft resources and draft capital. And it's all true and understandable and defensible. But look, if, if you're Ryan Poles, if you're, if you're a general manager of a franchise that is doing what the Bears are doing this offseason, and you have a quarterback that doesn't fit, and you have a quarterback you're about to draft that is, you believe, you believe, you might be wrong. Everybody might be wrong about Caleb Williams. But if the Bears believe, whether it's Caleb Williams or another guy, that this quarterback they're about to draft is transformational and going to take you places you haven't been in a very long time, then this is all irrelevant conversation about a return that nobody's going to care about in six months or six years. And a a six-round draft pick is is okay. What's the difference between a six and a fourth and and a fourth and a third? Well, it might be a backup center and it might be a starting safety and whatever the case would be. You want your quarterback. Freudian slip. Freudian slip by you because you said it might be a backup center. Guess what? Earlier this month, the Chicago Bears traded a fifth-round pick away for a backup interior offensive lineman that may have a chance to start in Ryan Bates. If we walked into March and we were sitting together, you know, on March 1st, uh, talking about the possible trade options for Justin Fields, and I had told you that they were going to trade Ryan Bates straight up for Justin Fields, you would have laughed me out of the room. David, you would have. And this is even worse than that because they got they gave up a 2024 fifth for Justin Fields, and they're getting a 2025 sixth possible four. I, I can't Fields. argue with that. I can't it, it put in those terms, of course. I probably would have had a chuckle and, and would have what I'm what I'm trying to say, probably not very well, is that the return doesn't what matter as much re- as what the, happens. The return in what you get is less important than the fact that he's That's leaving. OK, that's right. I, I He's agree leaving. with you on that. And, 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 and it, that. it sounds harsh to somebody who is as popular as Justin Fields has become in Chicago. But if I'm Ryan Poles and I'm doing my job right, I have come to the conclusion that this is addition by subtraction. You are removing. You are removing the incumbent quarterback that is popular in the locker room and you're making as much about your organization conducive to winning and a new rookie quarterback as possible. He can't be here. Justin Fields could not stay. And if that's what, if if you accept that reality, then really the return doesn't matter. It doesn't doesn't. matter entirely. It matters a little bit. I agree with you to, to that extent. I will guarantee you this though. Ryan Poles didn't hang up the phone with Omar Khan. He didn't hang up the phone with Justin Fields and go around Hellas Hall high fiving people. I think he probably swallowed hard, had to take a deep exhale and go, whoa, you know, that was tough. It was tough to say goodbye to a quarterback that I respect. It was tough to take that return on a trade that I don't think Ryan Poles would have even imagined when we met with him at the combine a couple of weeks ago. Right. Um, this, but, but it's the end. Right. And, and that, that's, that's the part of this, that the city of Chicago now has to accept. Exactly. You, exactly. Loss is hard. felt it in different ways. You're going to feel it again on Monday morning when when you have your four and a half hour talk show on 670 The Score. I can tell you unequivocally that this is the most fascinating reaction by people locally, by people nationally, of anything that I've ever cov- covered in the NFL. The wide range of reaction to this deal, to the Justin Fields era, to what it was. It's like it 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 is another thing that makes your head spin off 
your neck. I'll put it to you this way. I was having a conversation with someone earlier on Sunday, David, and said that, the, you know, the, the most passionate Bears fans who feel wronged by the trade and the exit of Justin Fields have had similar reactions to that day a couple years ago when the Chicago Cubs in a, like, whatever it was, a 26-hour span Oh, the away. purge? I, I, Ryan, I, Anthony Rizzo, and, and Javi Baez. And I'll, I'll give you your say in a second. It feels similar in a lot of ways in terms of the way some people have reacted to it. What throws me off with that, those dude won, won five playoff series. Thank they won, you. They won a World Series. Thank you. They changed the entire direction of the Chicago Cubs franchise. They rewrote history. Justin Fields won 10 regular season games. And so I have never been able to understand the disconnect between the level of acclaim that so many people have wanted to put on Justin Fields because they liked the way he made them feel and the level of actual achievement that he had in his three years and 38 starts with the Chicago Bears. It's incongruent. And that's why it's so strange to feel that level of emotion attached to a player leaving Chicago when the level of accomplishment was what it was. Uh, yeah, I have no problem, you know, Removing emotion from the equation. That's highly unpopular in our business because of the fans that, you know, help us do what we do. But that's the only difficult part about this is the emotional attachment to a guy that was here for three years and made people feel good because he was the most exciting Bears player since Devin Hester. But he wasn't a very accurate thrower and he wasn't an NFL passer and he wasn't a guy that you trust to get you to the playoffs or the Super Bowl or be a, a, the transformational guy that uh, is the difference maker. And and it's not just Ryan Poles concluding that. It's the rest of the National Football League concluding that. So if you accept that, they accept that, then you, you, you understand why they're moving on. If Justin Fields were as good as his supporters, large group of supporters, and I don't know how large it is, Dan. I, I wonder if we're it's overreacting. It's big. No, it's big. Social media and, and talk radio audiences are, are – a very loud, maybe vocal minority. I, I don't know. I don't know if there's a majority of fans that favor. Like, if, if the Bears did their own poll, I don't know if people would think that Justin Fields should stay. I, I, I don't know about that. You know, this is an easy football decision. This is an easy football equation. What's complicating everything is the fact that he's extremely popular, but his production never matches popularity. It didn't. No. And you, you've done the best job in town of, of documenting that to to the uh, to the chagrin of, of every Justin Fields supporter. You know, it is hard to remove remove emotion from the equation, but that's what we have to do. Yeah. Other people don't have to do that. You know, I almost threw something at the screen when you said when you compared what he did and his his fan base. The 2016 Cubs made history. <laughs> I wasn't comparing the accomplishments. I, I, I do you agree that 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 with with some of the things that you've read and heard spoken in the last thirty hours, they're there similar. Is a, there's a they're level. Of, there's a level of uh, disbelief and depression to the divorce from Justin Fields for for a group of people that it, like it has people on the floor, and, yeah. and it was like I, that for those I, three I, three Cubs stars that that I, helped the Cubs get over that that hump. Uh, the emotions right. are similar. The, the accomplishments the, the, the are, emotion, aren't, the emotions aren't are similar. similar. I, I think I understood. I understood that 24 hour span in 2021 when they, they purged and got rid of everybody. I understood why. Was that 21? Was it that long ago now? Yeah, I think it was. Okay. Um, and I, and I think that when they traded Rizzo and Baez and Bryant and, and a span of 24 hours and everybody was, was out the door. I got that because they had actually been here longer than three years. Yes. They'd actually done something that was going to be remembered for longer than three years. They were years. on the mountaintop. They got to the mountaintop. Yeah. They didn't just no. point at it and go, oh, that's where we're going. What I, what I hate about this reality right now is that, you know, based on the overheated reaction to him being traded, it forces you to point out things that he didn't accomplish. And it, make, it paints you into a corner that makes you seem like you're attacking him. And really, I think that I prefer to be respecting him. I, I think no that his, his his goodbye note was as classy as they come. He was mentally tough. He was a guy you wanted to um, be teammates with and you trusted as a leader. He was just limited as an NFL passer. And I think that if that weren't the case, he would still be a bear. And I think they would have maybe gone a different direction. But, you know, I, I don't 
think that this reaction is <laughs> is reflective of what's really going on here. And what's really going on at Hallis Hall is the Bears have turned a corner. Yeah, right. This is progress. We talked on our last episode. The addition of Keenan Allen was a, another move in a direction that tells you the window is opening for you. You have an opportunity now with the number one pick in a draft that a lot of quarterback savvy people have been looking forward to for a couple of years now to draft a player with a level of talent that doesn't come around very often. I'm not using the G word. I'm not going to do it. You are sitting here now with the chance to really, really put a charge into your entire football program at Hallis Hall. I talked to Mark Grody earlier this afternoon on the air about how Ryan Poles doesn't have to be um, forced to repent for his predecessor's sins. Right. Just because Ryan Pace and, and Matt Nagy and Ted, McC or Ted Phillips and George McCaskey didn't set Justin Fields up for success doesn't mean we should begrudge Ryan Poles for giving Caleb Williams or whoever the quarterback is in a month the opportunity to launch their career with much greater help around him and much greater support and much greater uh, potential catalyst to his success than Justin had. This is what we have longed for in Chicago is for leadership to see through a prism that allows you to understand what opportunities are in front of you and how to make the most of them. Ryan Poles is doing that right now. He's built a roster with a very, very strong defense. He has built an offense now that is going to give his next quarterback plenty of playmaking weapons. He went out and he rebooted at the offensive coordinator position with a guy who has experience calling plays. We're going to have to see how Shane Waldron does in that role. But they've taken a number of steps that, that people in Chicago have longed for the leadership of the Chicago Bears to take to help a young quarterback make the next leap. You're just going to have to spend the next five and a half months readying yourself for the idea that, yes, you are taking steps backwards in regards to the developmental process of the quarterback, and you can't expect Caleb Williams in game one to be where he's going to be and start 38, but you should expect Caleb Williams to reach start 38 with a level of success and accomplishment and achievement that far surpasses Justin Fields. Everyone's going to want that overnight, right? And that that's that's where, or not everyone, but 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 the most impatient and overeager, overzealous fans are going to want that to happen immediately. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. This is a long view. Okay. Ryan Poles' entire focus is to set the Chicago Bears up to have sustained success for the next decade. He's doing so. Now we got to just be patient and wait and see how it all plays out. Totally agree with that. Everything you said. Totally agree with the fact that Poles has had a very productive offseason. And I think it's been very strategic. And I'm not even getting into what he didn't get for Justin Fields. That gets so far off the track. I will say I, this I, before you continue. That, that this trade, to your previous point, which maybe is a, a quicker way for me to, to – to say it is he read the room with this trade, right? And even if the return was, was yes. more modest than we expected, Ryan Poles read the room properly. He read the room in terms of the, the room is the rest of the league. But Dan, he may have read the room in his own and Chicago front office and, and what's going on here by, again, addition by subtraction is overly harsh, but you could not have Justin Fields be a member of the Bears organization on the night you drafted Caleb Williams. That would have been no. really unfair to both men. And I just don't think you wanted to do that. So this feels like a, a giveaway. This feels like one step away from having cut him. I, I broached that last week and got pounded for it. But I do think this is almost as close to that. A That's six really round close to it. Yeah, six-round conditional pick. You're talking about a punter, I'm possibly. But but back back, back to the tr thing that, that I don't want to say concerns me, but none of this is like – it's all going to take care of itself if if the player is as good as as people suggest he will be in Williams. But how many people out there in Bears fandom, if we were to take our own poll, to take the North Pole, and ask the question, which group is higher? The group of people that want to see Justin Fields succeed as a Pittsburgh Steeler quarterback <laughs> or the number of people that want to see Caleb Williams struggle as a starting Bears quarterback? Right now, on you know th this weekend in March, within hours of Justin Fields getting traded, which number do you think is higher, percentage wise? I think that that Venn diagram is just two circles on top of each other, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, like, isn't it isn't it the same group? <laughs> like, isn't that the same group there? I mean, like, no, no. I mean, if you, you I, I'm I'm suggesting that there's so many people that are so tied into 
loving Justin Fields and thinking the Bears did him wrong right. and made a mistake in trading him, that they want him to succeed with the Steelers to prove how, how right they are. And so, so that group that group is bigger than the, the, the group that wants to uh, see Caleb Williams struggle as a bear. Okay. Unfortunately, the group that wants to see Caleb Williams struggle as a bear is too big, way too big. And it, it, it to me, this is part of the story here in 2024 is whether those folks can rein themselves in in a way that allows the temperature to come way, way down in this city from where it's been over the last three months. This has been almost borderline embarrassing, if you ask me, with some of the reaction that's been out there on your airwaves, on my social media feed, across Twitter. Um, you need to get yourself settled and take a deep breath and walk around the block and come back inside and realize that this quarterback that they take next deserves the opportunity to prove himself before you you flip on him. I've been laughing all afternoon at the number of messages that are out there on social media and calls to to, to sports talk radio and, and videos that have been posted that, that argue that it's win or else, or it's playoffs or bust in 2024. And, and, and my answer is like, or else what, or else like what? It, 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 like huh. if Caleb Williams goes seven and 10 this year and has some rookie struggles and doesn't reach the level of expectation as a rookie that we think you're going to, you're, you're going to get rid of him after a season. I mean, like, or else what, like, what does the bust mean? What does the, or else mean? Like be ready for a rookie quarterback to struggle. Now the pushback that you're going to get and I'm going to get is, well, you guys told us he was the next Mahomes. You guys told us he was the next Andrew Luck. Well, like, just relax, like relax, let him get his feet on the ground. Let him figure out how to play NFL football. If the team gets in the playoffs next year, fantastic. If they're nine and eight and they miss out because they're a game back or lose a tiebreaker to get in the playoffs, but the quarterback is clearly ascending in a direction where you say, yeah, that looks like what a high level NFL quarterback looks like then you're fine and you move forward and you say, great, we're in a great position. It's just the, again, this discussion has been so supercharged that irrationality has, has taken over and smothered the city. And, and we're going to have to find a way to get that calm down in a way. Otherwise it's, it's going to be just insufferable to follow the rookie year development. Caleb Williams. I'll throw this at you. Cause I asked this question on Saturday night, Justin Fields was given three years by a, a large group of the fan base of, of almost unequivocal forgiveness for his sins, right? Like he, it, they were blamed here. We tried to set up the no excuses tour for season three and everybody gave us more excuses. The bus filled with more excuses. Right. And Caleb Williams is not going to get that because this fan base is so scarred and they're so divided and they're so impatient and they're so eager. I don't like, do you think it's possible for, the rookie season outside evaluation of, of Caleb Williams to be done in a measured way that marries up with how it's going to be done inside the building in Lake Forest. I don't think there's anything about the fan base that ha I've seen in the last six months that would uh, make me even tempted to use the term measured way. <laughs> so no, I do think that the approach internally will be smart. I do think that the approach internally will be, um, intelligent and putting him in the best positions to succeed. We've already seen that you've got a rookie quarterback. Presumably it's going to be Williams unless something goes terribly wrong. And you've got Keenan Allen and DJ Moore as his wide receivers, Deandre Swift as an explosive running back. You're likely going to upgrade your offensive line. Maybe in the draft, you've got two tight ends that you trust in the red zone. You're a much better offensive football team upgrade upgrades at every position that you replace. So, they're doing the right thing. That's getting lost in this whole this whole cloud of controversy over what they didn't get for Justin Fields and how they did him wrong. You know, when they say, and everybody, and this is not new, but, you know, it's so easy to overlook the fact that, yeah, the Bears made mistakes and not structuring things to fit his skill set and all those things that we have litigated time and again and over and over. But it, that absolves too easily what Justin Fields' role it was in all of this. He didn't take that next step. He didn't do enough when the games were on the line. He didn't hit every open receiver, and he didn't do the things that would have made other teams tempted to want to trade for him, to be their starter, to be their guy. He never – he was so explosive and so fun to watch, but the individual highlights never outweighed – the passing inconsistency. That's the biggest problem with Justin Fields. That's his legacy. Yeah, great highlights. He had a great six-game stretch. Terrific. But then what happened? It was, yeah, inconsistency and, and 
the lack of success in, in game on the line moments. I told Mark Grody this afternoon that this topic has been so supercharged. And when I know we're going to do a podcast or when I know I'm going on the air, I start writing down notes. I filled up like three gas station receipts. This okay. is a, like, I mean, we could talk about this for another week. Get to the I, other points that you haven't gotten to. What have I not touched on? What do you think we all need to know? Because well, I've got two, I've got two. And okay. if you'll indulge me for a couple minutes, sure. I've got 20, but these are the two that I think are most worthwhile of talking now. Let's stick here because there is a legitimate question that has been asked about why the Bears didn't wait longer to make the trade. And I'll turn that over to you in a second. There, there's two possible um, things that have been floated as hypotheticals for them. Number one, why not just wait until the draft gets here and have the opportunity to see if someone else gets desperate and gives you a higher um, payoff for the trade for Justin Fields? That's one. Number two is why not just carry him into August and September or possibly October. And when a team loses their starter, you trade them and, and you hold a desperate team hostage and, and, you, and you get a bigger return on that. I think you and I have kind of documented the answer to that second question very, very significantly in the recent weeks and saying like, look, that situation of, of creating that circus and that volume of noise in your building was never under consideration for the leaders at House Hall of having those two guys share a practice field. But why not hold that pick or, or hold Justin Fields until the draft gets here and just see if a team that couldn't get itself what they wanted in late April would be willing to give you something there. What what would you respond to that part of the question? Because I think that one is a, at least a legitimate question. Okay, so say that again. So so you're why, asking why not, me why not why not wait to trade Justin Fields until the draft weekend arrived and you had an opportunity to see if someone else got a little bit more desperate and decided to offer you more than a conditional uh, six. I think it goes back to and again you may think I'm naive here, but I think it goes back to the original goal. Your original goal was to get something in return. Your original goal, you're driven by the fact that as much as you respect and like the player, you've got to move on from the player. And once you've concluded internally that it's really not a feasible situation to have both guys in the quarterback room, and that is untenable, Dan, you're driven by, I don't want to say desperation, but urgency. There's an urgency. I sense that there was an urgency to get Justin Fields out to move him so you can move on in every way. And I think that if you wait until the draft to do that, yeah, you might squeeze out a fourth rounder, a fifth rounder, maybe even a sixth rounder this year. But I just don't think that it's a risk worth taking because of what would happen if teams, as we know, happens during the draft, everything's fluid and things change. And so maybe they aren't as impressed. So you get to the draft, everybody's taking their guys, and then, you know, nobody wants Justin still. Are you stuck with them? Or are you You're just, probably stuck with them. Or you say, hey, Pittsburgh, hey, can, can, can we get that conditional six? Maybe. Job? That's a month ago. Unless they drafted, but, you know. But, a, maybe a Pittsburgh want, but maybe Pittsburgh wanted an answer, right? Yeah, exactly. And maybe yeah. maybe maybe they would use that. The other part of this is off-season programs for these teams will start in mid-April, a couple weeks before the draft. And so you could conceivably say, okay, Justin, just don't come back to the building there. But that's not doing right by him because he wants to work. He wants to get better. He wants to know what team he's playing for in 2024 and what offense he's playing. And so you are doing right by him by getting him some clarity and a chance to get himself going on that level going forward. So that's part of it. Now, this is the last question I have for you because I think this is one that we will revisit as time goes on. I'm curious to know what you think the responsibility of the Chicago Bears organization is for messaging expectations for their next quarterback consistently and emphatically going forward. And I'll give you some context before you get okay. your thoughts on this. I'm driving home from crossover practices in Indianapolis last summer, driving back from Indianapolis up I-65, and I get a call from someone not on the football side of the building but connected to Hallis Hall, said to me, where is this Justin Fields MVP talk coming from? And whoever started it needs to have their bleeping head examined. And I said, thank you. Like That's what we've been trying to say on our airwaves and our podcast for a while, that it's just not a reasonable bar to set for this quarterback at this stage of his development with this stuff that's around him right now. And the fact that that conversation got out of control, I think created some of the emotions that have continued to crescendo and crest here. The season ends. I get a call from someone inside the building that says to me, I don't know how the messaging of the expectations for Justin Fields going into 2023 weren't handled better because it created this situation where as the season went on, it was just a shouting match everywhere you went with people trying to point the fingers on why he didn't reach the level of expectation that people set for him, even though internally the thought was, 
well, we're just trying to see him make incremental growth here and, and progress to a level where he shows he can be a, a, a difference making starter in this league. And so I'm just curious because you know that the Caleb Williams experience in particular is going to be a spectacle. What is the responsibility of the Chicago Bears to be on top of that on a weekly basis to message to their world and their orbit what the proper expectations inside the building are for the quarterback so that people can set their uh, radars and their calibration meters accordingly? Well, if they're smart, they'll take control of it by trying to manage it as much as they can with Caleb Williams' team. It would be a mistake to try to alienate that team. And I would think that team would understand you want to slow play him into the league. There are going to be enough attention and enough things that are kind of oversized without having to add to it. You don't need to uh, be uh, – I, I would low-key it if I were his team. And if I were the Bears, I would recommend that. Um like he's I, like I, he's likely to be the odds on favorite to be the rookie of the year, the offensive good. rookie of the year, right? Like then right let his let let his make him available as much as the league mandates. Um have some grace with some people that might want some extra time or whatever in terms of him. He's got established relationships in a new market. You don't want to alienate those relationships or sour them before they get started or become something that could be beneficial for everybody. I just think you have to take a very common sense approach, which the Bears don't often do or haven't always done with superstar players or star caliber players. Um, once you do that, I think the rest is somewhat out of your control. I, I don't think I necessarily hold the Bears responsible for the oversized expectations with Justin Fields or things getting carried away. I think the fan base um, can think of and do whatever. There's, it's, it's Fan is short for fanatic. If you want to think that you saw an MVP caliber possibility uh, out in Justin Fields and you're a fan, go ahead and bet on FanDuel, whatever odds they are. I think what you're getting at, I don't I don't know that you're getting at this, but I've, I'll introduce it. The media that covers the Bears has to be more responsible in 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 report in, in handling things professionally because they're not fans. Now, it, there's a very blurry line, blurrier than ever, the between fans and media. But I think as a, as Caleb Williams, you know, gets set to arrive in Chicago. And we start to get past the Justin Fields era and all that represented. Maybe you learn a lesson from that. And maybe you do take a step back and maybe you're cautious and, and measured and more fair. And th maybe that will be reflect a more responsible approach to seeing what we see and not seeing things we want to see. You ever watch the Firefest documentary on Netflix? No. Okay. Uh, Is that the one with Tom Brady? No, no, this is this Kirk is Cousins. about a music festival that, oh, no. that, that that was advertised to be something that it, that it certainly wasn't. And and for, to our audience members that have seen that and understand that cultural phenomenon, I bring that up because it's the, the level of outrage that mushrooms up when oversized uh, promises aren't kept is enormous right it, it's it's exponential the level of of anger and disappointment when when you've been promised and sold something that was not possible all along and so that's what i worry about the, I, I ask this less from a media perspective as, as much as i ask it from an in the building perspective of what is the bear's responsibility for having a, a pulse on that for managing that like i i talked to someone last week about the idea that that you, you know like Caleb Williams is is going to be a phenomenon. You know what I mean? He's going to have national eyes on him every single day that he's a Chicago Bear, and there's a spectacle comes that comes with that. And and within the the spectacle that you're managing, how do you manage the expectations of what people are seeing? Like I internally, Ryan Poles and and his group and his coaching staff and Matt Eberflus, they're going to set a bullseye for 2024, and I think it's important for the outside world to understand where their bullseye is, you know, so that, so, so that if, if it's hit, it's hit, if right. it's not hit and you're close, it's, it's not close and you're hit. But if you set a bullseye that, that is completely out of sorts with what the internal people within the football team believe is possible. Okay. Just creating potential chaos, which I think this field situation has been chaos. For okay. The last I, and I, and I, plus. I, 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 you know, you know, I'm not going to disagree with you. You know, we're on the same page there, but I do think that you might be letting this experience maybe, I don't want to say cloud your judgment, but affect how your, your expectations for the next era. And, and I think that you have every right to do that because I think that, you know, 
Chicago doesn't do this well. The Bears certainly don't handle these things well. But if, if I'm in that building and it's my job to be part of that group that is either, a, let's just say I'm, they hired me as a consultant, a Caleb consultant. That could be a good job. Even a Kevin and, consultant. Sit next to Kevin Warren and give him advice. Okay. So this is the advice I would give him as far as Caleb Williams is concerned with all of the hype ready to be exploding in, in September or maybe even earlier. Focus on the football. Focus on the football. That's your advice to Caleb? That's my advice to everybody in that building. Okay, keep it on the football. Yeah, you want to go out and you want to endorse this, fine. As long as you can do that in your off time, as long as you can be responsible and, re and represent the organization professionally and with class, certainly do whatever you need to do because you are our guy. We work for you. You are the de facto CEO of the Chicago Bears. We understand that, but this is what I think is going to help you and help everybody. Get the football right. Get it right first, last, and always. Be the first guy there. Be the last guy to leave. Work on your craft. Win games. Succeed on the field. And then everything else will come. And then everything else won't be, won't be complaining about the circus. We'll be enjoying the ride. And I think that's what I would tell everybody in that building. When We're not used to it in Chicago because nobody's ever taken care of the football. There's so many losing teams and so much of losing culture. That's why people don't know what to see and react when they see Justin Fields. He was 10 and 28, which isn't all his fault. But three years of losing is not something to get nostalgic about, people. This is not anything to bemoan the loss of. You're making progress. Recognize it. When Caleb Williams focuses on football, good things are going to happen. And if that's not the case, then he's going to be a bust and we'll make history and we'll be off the air and we'll be fired from our jobs because we were dead wrong and loud about being wrong. But you get the football right, the other stuff, you're laughing. Yeah, and, and we'll see where it goes. Uh, look, like, again, th th this is not over, you know, and I think there's a sense that, okay, we've reached the finish line of the Justin Fields, Caleb Williams comparison debate. It's not <laughs> Over. I that's know. a long way from over. You I know. know that that's going to last through the first month and a half of Caleb Williams' rookie season. Caleb Williams is active on social media. We see him make a few posts a week on, on Twitter. We see him like posts on social media. My first advice would be cancel your account, brother. Like, just get, <laughs> get that out of here because this is not the time for you to get in the for you column of your mentions uh, on social media. It is a outrageous place out there and 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 Caleb Williams who just turned 22 in November is going to have to set himself up for mental clarity and psychological success as much as he is invested in learning the playbook of Shane Waldron and and working through the passing game concepts of Thomas Brown and figuring out what the hits principle means to a quarterback and 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 trying to lead a locker room full of men that that now are losing one of their leaders in Justin Fields and are going to be turning to him to be their heartbeat during times of tumult Right. Yep. That's a yep. lot of weight. That's a lot, lot of weight. weight. To carry. A lot of weight. So you, right, better, good stuff. You, you better shed the weight that other people are trying to put on you. Any other gas station receipts you wrote on the back of uh, this, any this, other uh, this grocery like lists? A, a park district. Uh, yeah, we had, we had to sign some questionnaire. Right, this, right. yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of paper around here. Permission David. slips. <laughs> yeah. The field trip Feels, permission slips. So sorry for your son. He's not going to be able to get into <laughs> that field trip tomorrow because your dad <laughs> took it because he had to get this great Caleb Williams thought. Things happen. By the way, he was the one that informed me of the Justin Fields trade on Saturday evening because I was out picking a pizza, picking up a pizza, and he got an alert on the iPad. And so I heard from him before I heard from anybody about the Justin Fields trade. Ryan Scoops Weederer. <laughs> How about that? It's a new nickname. Let's keep him away from journalism, please. Um, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Whatever he wants to do. How, how's he going to be a journalist when he's in the majors, pitching for the Cubs every fifth day? That's right. That's right. That's he right. was uh, drafted in the third round by the House League White Sox on Saturday. Uh, and, and travel ball starts here in about three weeks. All right. Can't wait. That's when we, our podcast will be even harder to schedule. Can't wait yeah, for that. No doubt. <laughs> all right. So that's all we have got on the Justin Fields trade, the Caleb Williams future, and a lot of other things. What a week it was in Beardom from the stadium to the trades to now Justin Fields <laughs> out. It's, we'll get to we'll get to Keenan Allen this week because he, he was introduced on Saturday at Hallis Hall. There's a lot there. There's a lot more to come. And we'll uh, get to all of it here on the free Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts and the U670 Scores YouTube page.
Feels like it's been 100 days since we learned about Jalen Johnson's sex addiction. This is the wildest month in Chicago Bears history, <clears throat> potentially. And we still got two weeks left, David. We still got two weeks left. The stadium, the the, the free agency, the, tra- the I, like wildest month, and there's still two weeks left, which includes Caleb Williams' pro day on Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. League, league meetings start next weekend. Can't I mean, wait. Off we go. Off we go. Let's go. Off we go. And we'll be there for every step of the way. Thank you for listening to the Take the North podcast. For Adam Sadzinski, our producer, Dan Weeder from the Chicago Tribune, I'm David Haw from the Mullen Haw Show. We will talk to you next time on the Take the North podcast. Great talk. See you out there. 